John chapter 13, as you're turning there, we began last week a really a new section of the Gospel of John. You can really uh, split the Gospel of John in two main sections. The first part from chapter 1 to chapter 20, or really a little later, but is really his public ministry, the public ministry of Jesus Christ. And we began last week with his private ministry to his disciples, particularly to the disciples from chapter 13 all the way to the end of chapter 17, Jesus Christ is going to prepare His disciples for His departure. He's about to be taken to the cross, and He's preparing His disciples, think about it, for the disciples to continue the ministry that He started. Not to begin their own ministry, but to continue what Jesus Christ started. And we talked last week about the first thing that He taught His disciples as He was there in the upper room, and it was really a message of humility in their service, and Jesus Christ gave them an example. He not only told them that they ought to be servants and to be humble, He showed them. He gave them the example. Now we begin here in verse 18, as we continue this chapter of John chapter 13. Notice verse 18, the Bible says, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him, and he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is, to whom I shall give a sop, When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children... Yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go ye cannot come, so now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, and that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another, one to another. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, Whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me hereafterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me. Thrice. I want to draw your attention again to notice verse 34, where the Bible says, A new commandment I give unto you. What's that new commandment? That ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. I want to preach this morning on this, a new commandment to love as Jesus loved. Now this is really the, apart from the time here we're going to see in just a moment where Jesus exposes Judas Iscariot unbeknownst to all the disciples. They really had no clue what was happening. They thought perhaps Judas was the most trusted disciple. They never thought 
it was Judas that would betray Jesus. But really the second thing after Jesus Christ taught his disciples about their service and they ought to serve in humility, there's no other way to serve the Lord but to serve him in humility. Jesus gave them an example. We talked about the man of humility. It was God himself who humbled himself and became a servant. We saw the model of humility. Jesus Christ gave the example. He became a service. Uh, he became a servant and he did the service. And we saw the exhortation. Uh, the, we saw Peter's natural impulse was, you're not going to wash my feet. And then he says, okay, well, wash my head and, and my hands and wash. And Jesus said, you don't have to be washed. Remember, he said, you are clean, but not all. And then he gave them the motivation of humility. He gave them the source of humility. It is God himself. As I have done to you, the supplication was, look, there is no other way to serve God than to serve in humility and the submission of humility. We talked about uh, that joy comes in the Christian life in the midst of humble service. We talked about how sometimes we have the idea in our lives that, well, when we do something, then we'll be satisfied. Or sometimes we do the opposite. We say, well, when I am happy, then I'll start serving God. And Jesus is teaching them, no, joy is in the midst of service. It doesn't come afterwards. It doesn't come before. It comes in the midst. Now, he's going to give them what I believe here is the second lesson that he wants his disciples to understand. And really, this is very important because the whole world is going to determine who the followers of Christ are by this truth this morning. And by the the world still determines those that are following Christ by this truth. So as we study this passage, we're going to see, first of all, notice the cruelty of Judas. The cruelty of Judas. From verse 18 now down to verse 30, Jesus Christ is going to expose Judas Iscariot. By the way, the Bible has been pointing out all throughout this time when Jesus Christ began his ministry that there would be one that would betray him, and that would be Judas. Now this is John looking back at all this. He note the disciples were clueless at the time when Judas was serving him. Oh, by the way, he had the bag of money. So perhaps he was the most trusted disciple, perhaps the most eloquent, perhaps the smartest as well to be able to deal with the money. And so nobody would have guessed uh, that Judas Iscariot was the one that would betray Jesus. Think about it. Sometimes you have the paintings today. You have the painting. Have you ever seen the painting of Jesus and all the 12 sitting there in the upper room? And Judas is, looks kind of this creepy guy. That's not how Judas looked. Perhaps he was even the best looking of, out of all of them. But it's not what we think in our minds today. But I want us to consider as we think about the cruelty of Judas, we see, first of all, it was anticipated by Christ. The Bible tells us in verse 18, I speak not of you all. Now what he had just finished talking to them about, uh, that the fact is they were clean. Remember Peter said, okay, wash my head, wash my hands. And Jesus said, no, you are already clean. You don't need to be clean again. Talking about you don't need to be saved again. In other words, you need to wash your feet. He's talking about sanctification, how as you walk in this world, you're going to be tainted by sin, and you need to make sure that you seek the cleansing of God for sanctification on a daily basis. He says, but, notice, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Think about it. He says, I know whom I have chosen chosen. God knows who have put their trust in Him. Judas, think about it. Judas' treachery was foreknown. Now let me stop and say this, but it does not mean that it was foreordained to do that dreadful thing. There's a difference there. The treachery of Judas was foreknown, but it was not foreordained. Judas had a choice. God didn't make him do it. Judas had a choice. Uh, there is a great deal of difference between God's foreknowledge and God's foreordination. He looked down, think about it, through the ages, and he knew what Judas would do, but he never foreordained it. Judas was free to yield to either the devil or to yield to Christ. He chose to yield to the devil. Jesus, Jesus himself said, Ye will not come to me that ye might have life. He says, you have refused to come to me, although I presented myself to you. You have refused. Revelation 22, 17 says, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You see, Judas, God did not make Judas do what he did. But God in his foreknowledge saw what Judas would do, and therefore he knew who it was since he began his ministry. 
So notice here, I have uh, notice. I speak not of your, for I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled, that he eateth bread uh, with me, hath lifted up his heel against me. Now he is quoting here uh, Psalm uh, chapter uh, 41. But think about, we can go back to uh, John chapter 6 verse 70, where the Bible says, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He did not say, one of you shall become a devil. One of you, or, or uh, he says, notice, one of you is a devil. One of you is a devil. Notice, we could go to John chapter 13, verse 10. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not saved uh, to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Now that's just last week's passage. So we see here that Judas uh, Iscariot was not, never a saved man. He had never personally received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And we have to understand that Jesus Christ sees through every man. He knew the whole time that Judas was a hypocrite. They may appear true on the outward, but Christ sees into the heart and knows those that are clean. Later in John chapter 17, verse 12, the Bible would say, Thou that gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. In other words, the implication here is that Judas was never given to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was never a child of God. Because all those that the Father gave to the Son, not one was lost. Think about it, the son of perdition was not one of those who had been given to Christ by the Father. He was in Christ's company, but he was never of the company. Uh, the Bible tells us also in 1 John uh, that those that are gone out were never of us. They had been in church in the meeting with us, but they were never of us. In other words, I am not going to be taken by surprise. I have foreseen this. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's telling his disciples, I want you to know uh, that I know everything that's going to happen to me. Because I'm God. Uh, he says, he tells his disciples, notice uh, in verse 19, Now I tell you before it come, uh, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am He. So in other words, the disciples really did not understand what was going on. They did not who, know who Jesus Christ was talking about. Uh, but when, one day they would look back and see it was Judas. And Jesus Christ knew, which proves again the fact that Jesus is God and His deity because He knew what Judas would do. So we see, notice it was anticipated by Christ, the cruelty of Judas. But number two, it was abrupt for the disciples. Uh, the notice the Bible says in uh, verse uh, 20, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now notice here, verse 22. Then the disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake. There is no confusion here. Can you see in the upper room here as they're all gathered and Jesus said, One of you is going to betray me? And the disciples look at one another. It's not like they guessed Judas, the one that looks like the devil. No. They were doubting themselves. Wow. They thought, is it me? That's the question they asked. They did not start blaming other people. They started asking, is it me that was going to betray the Lord? There certainly was confusion among the disciples. They did not seem uh, to call anybody out in particular. They doubted themselves. Even think about it, uh, Peter. Uh, the Bible says in notice verse 23, Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. As Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. Now think, can you see here the confusion? They're kind of upset by what, what, by what they just heard. And John, who's right beside the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Peter kind of gets his eye. And I can, he doesn't say anything that we see in this passage, but he kind of goes, like, you're going to ask him who it is? He beckoned him. He's like, like I, you know, you kind of see them. They're all looking at him, and Peter's like, Come on, ask him. And so the Bible tells us that John is going to ask him now. There was leaning, uh, oh, verse 24, uh, verse 25. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Who is it? 
So think about the cruelty of Judas was anticipated by Christ. It was abrupt for the disciples, but it was also announced before all. Jesus is going to say, Jesus answered verse 26. He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And so we think here, wow, here it is. Let's get him out. No, they had no idea what just happened. The, uh, I want us to think, in that day, a selected morsel was dipped in a sauce by the host and presented to a special guest. Jesus was showing uh, John by this action that it was Judas. This was kind of something that was done to, for honored guests to kind of show the house this is a special person. And so to them in their mind here, what Jesus is doing is something that is customary to honor a special guest. They didn't realize that Jesus Christ was pointing out that Judas was the one that would betray him. This is how, think of how far they were to think it was Judas that was going to betray. He had the bag of money. He was the one that was in charge of the finances, and so they did not doubt Judas. None of the disciples seemed to realize what had just been done. They perhaps thought for sure it was not Judas, since Jesus had dipped uh, 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 and singled out the most trusted disciples. So think about it. It kind of did the reverse. They thought to themselves, well, that's what Jesus said to Judas. We know it's not Judas. Because Jesus had dipped the bread and given it to him. Notice he, the Bible says, and after the sop, or, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something uh, to the poor. You see here, that's how the disciples, as they reacted to Jesus and his action, and when he said to Judas, after he basically, uh, in their mind, gave him a position of honor, said, this is a special one, singled him out, they thought it can't be Judas. Well, Jesus would have sent him out to get some food in preparation for the feast. Or maybe he just sent him out to uh, give money to the poor. That apparently was something that was habitually done, Jesus instructing Judas. And so they, to them, there is nothing here out of the ordinary. They don't see anything uh, uh, different than usual here. Uh, they're still doubting within themselves, uh, who is it that should betray the Lord? I want us to look at the last words of verse 30. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. You know, it is a sad thing, perhaps one of the saddest things, to have walked with the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of heaven who became flesh, to have heard His preaching, to have seen His miracles, to have been around Him like no other person was privileged to, and to see Him for the last time, leave the presence of light to go into darkness. What a sad thing. Do you see Judas here leaving the light of the world in the upper room to go to the darkness outside in the night. He leaves the fellowship and the presence of Jesus to be in the presence of darkness. And for the rest of eternity, Judas would never again enjoy the light, but would walk in darkness for the remainder of his earthly life and for eternity to follow. What a devastation! To think that Judas and all the light that he had received uh, still because he was consumed with himself uh, and what he wanted and as an old ambition he was too earthly minded that he missed the light of the world. So we see the cruelty of Judas. It was anticipated by Christ. It was abrupt for the disciples and it was announced before all although they didn't realize it. But we see number two the commandment from Jesus. Now, as we think about this commandment, this is in the midst of betrayal. This is in the midst of perhaps the greatest betrayal that has ever taken place in all of human history. Jesus is going to give them a new commandment. Notice verse 31. The Bible says, Therefore when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. 
If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the, unto, unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. I want us to think as we consider about this commandment. It comes, first of all, with the exaltation of his deity. The Bible says it did not look like God was about to be glorified. He just said, someone is going to betray me. He just told them earlier that he's about, the hour is come. He's about to be taken in the hands of sinners. He's about to be put to death. And after three days, he was, he's about to rise from the dead. And so we, not, we would not think now is the time for God to be glorified. For the following three days, they would be questioning this statement. Just in a few hours from now, a group of soldiers would come. And take him away. And the Bible makes it clear here that Jesus said, look, this is the time that God is glorified. I want to ask the question, what was there to glory in? Well, I think it's very simple. He would settle the sin problem before a holy God. Jesus Christ would settle the sin problem before a holy God. Jesus went to the cross not to glorify the sinner, but to glorify God. That's why in John chapter 17, verse 4, the Bible says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. God's glory comes first, and then that finished work on the cross by which our souls are saved. Uh, there was a, a lady on one occasion came to a servant of God. When asked if she was saved, she replied this, I don't understand it. I, I see that Jesus died for me, but surely there is something I must do. That seems too simple a way for anyone to be saved. The other said, my dear friend, it was God who sent His Son to die. It was God who put on Him all that our sins deserved. Christ has borne that judgment for you. And now God is satisfied. And if God is satisfied, surely you should be. She looked up somewhat startled and she said, I have never seen it in that way before. Surely I should be satisfied with that which satisfies God. I can trust Him. I can take Him at His word. So as Jesus Christ says, therefore when he was come out, Jesus said, think about it now, Judas has gone out, the devil has gone out with him, and now he can say something to his disciples. After that he has left, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Think about it here. God in this act would be glorified. Uh, we have to think, we cannot but help but think about uh, the wrath of God that's revealed among an unbelieving world as we trace really the, uh, the, the parade of human history and Adam and his sin against God. And as we think about all the children, uh, the children after Adam that sinned uh, against God throughout all those ages. And think about the wrath of God is being stored up in heaven where God wants to pour out His judgment upon an unbelieving world. But because of His grace and because of His mercy, his judgment is held back. We find snippets of it throughout the Old Testament as the nation of Israel would sin drastically against God. God at times would pour out His judgment, not exterminate all of mankind, but show to the world that His wrath is being stored up against a world that's rejecting Him and that's praising false God that aren't even alive. And so the wrath of God has been stored up and God in His justice and His fury upon sin has been waiting now for a sacrifice that's been announced throughout the centuries and now Jesus Christ finally is coming to that hour where God is to be glorified. Where God would be satisfied. Where the demands of the law would be met by Jesus Christ Himself. And think about as we see Jesus Christ coming to the cross. The Bible says He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And He went to the cross. And can you see as there was blackness and darkness as Jesus died on the cross. We see the blackness covers the earth and there was a trembling and shaking. The wrath of God think that was held back. Can you see here God holding His judgment back on a world that has sinned against Him, willfully sinned against Him, and that has that shake their fist in the face of God and say, we're not going to live for you. We're not going to obey your word. We're going to live our own lives and the wrath of God has been stored up. But then Jesus dies on the cross and the wrath is dispersed. 
God is glorified. Sin can no more have dominion upon the life of a person. God was glorified. And as could you see here, Jesus Christ, as Judas, filled with Satan, goes out. Jesus said, now, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in Him. The time that has been so long awaited is finally arrived. The righteous demands of God would finally be met. So we see the exaltation of deity, but number two, we see the explanation of departure. He says in verse 33, Little children, yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. Now, back in John chapter 8 and verse 12, let's turn there a few pages here. John chapter 8, verse 12. <clears throat> Notice what he says here. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have, notice, the light of life. Jesus Christ, as he came, he was the light of the world. Uh, his light, according to chapter 1, lighteth every man that has come into the world. But he also told his disciples, according to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, ye are the light of the world. Jesus was the light of the world. But then he points and turns to his disciples and says, Ye are the light of the world. So notice here how he addresses his disciples. He says the first time, according to what I've studied, the first time he addresses his disciples as my little children. That's uh, the way we see the endearment. Yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, he had told the Jews before that where he was going, they could not come. But to the Jews, he said, you cannot come because you're not saved. And you're going to die in your sins. But now to the disciples, not talking about the same departure that they can't come. He's about to go to the cross. He says later that where I am, you can come afterwards. But not right now. He would leave his disciples on earth. He gives them an explanation. He's about to depart. He says, I am the light of the world. But you're my little children. I'm going to a place, but you're staying here. You cannot come now where I am. You have to remain here. You have to remain as a light in this world. The disciples would be left as the light in a dark world. So the commandment from Jesus, we see the exaltation of His deity. We see the explanation of His departure. But number three, we see the evidence of discipleship. And this is really what I want to spend time because uh, in this passage it says, Notice a new commandment I give unto you. Now, this should really, we should perk up when we hear that. Jesus say that. This new commandment I give unto you. There's something new here that's never been said before. It is not discounting everything that Jesus said. It is adding to what Jesus said. It is not discounting all the commandments of the past. It is adding to. It is a new uh, commandment. I want us to think here again this commandment. That ye love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if ye have love one another. To another, I want us to consider, first of all, as we think about the evidence of discipleship, we see, first of all, the initiator of the command. It is interesting, as we study earlier in the, in the book of uh, uh, John, in ch chapter 13, he says, notice, in verse 12, So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down, he again said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. I, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that as ye should do, that ye should do as I have done to you. Notice the word again, as I have done. And now he says, As I have loved you. Who is the initiator of this love that we're talking about? It's God. 
John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is not that we loved Him, but that He first loved us and gave His life a ransom for us. Earlier, when showing his disciples the example of servanthood, he, in his humility, he says, look, this is, I want you to do as I have done, not like I tell you. And here he says, look, you ought to have the love that I have had for you. So we see the initiator of the command. It is someone that has supreme love. Nobody understands love until they understand the love of God. And by the way, I believe that you cannot be the husband you ought to be and the wife you ought to be and the pastor you ought to be and the Sunday school teacher you ought to be if you do not first understand the love of God. The initiator of the command. But we see number two, the impact of the command. He says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. What's the this? The new commandment. For the disciples to love one another. You know, throughout the Word of God, we see lots of that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. And be a kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a great passage here, uh, the passage on love. We call this the love chapter. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Notice verse 1. And really it would do good for us to test our love by this passage. Notice 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and, and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. The word charity here is love. Love in action. Love that, a love that gives. He says, look, you can have the gift of tongues. Uh, you can... Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, you can prophesy and understand all mysteries and all, knowledge, and all knowledge. And though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and to have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now, now think about it, this is pretty serious. He said, look, you can prophesy, you can be the greatest preacher ever, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. You can get all your money, you can empty your bank account and give it to the poor, and if you don't have charity, love, you are nothing. You can have the greatest gift in the church, if you don't have love, you're nothing. Why? Because love, the impact of love is what determines to a world that we are indeed His disciples. Now, I want us to think about that because uh, he does not say here uh, that the world is going to know by your doctrine. He says, the world is going to know by your love. We ought to have the right doctrine. And the Word of God shows us why we ought to stand for the right doctrine. Why we ought not to compromise and be disobedient to the Word of God. We understand that. But he says, how does the world know? In other words, he's saying you can have the right doctrine, but the world can look at your life and with no love will not be impacted by the doctrine you believe, but they sure will be impacted by the love you have for one another. That's how the world is going to know that you are my disciples. He goes on to say in verse 4, charity, think about, charity suffereth long. Ouch. Ouch. And is kind. Ouch. <laughs> Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Uh, seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. The point is, charity never faileth. It would do good again for us to test ourselves by 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
Let's not forget to examine ourselves faithfully and honestly and see if we are allowing hatred and malice in our hearts while presuming to be holding on to the Lord Jesus Christ. The proof of the followers of Christ is love for the brethren. That's the proof. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. He restates that in those shorter later books. Notice 1 John chapter 2. Notice verse 7. Brethren, I write a new commandment unto you. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Notice verse 9. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in the darkness even until now. That's what he says. Verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. And there is one occasion and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Think about it here. Love, he says, is uh, the how the, yes, the world knows. But think about it. There is no occasion of stumbling in him. In other words, love is the motivation. And again, uh, love, what we're talking about is because of our love Godward. You see, if we love God as we ought to love Him, we'll love fellow men as we ought to love them. Because the motivation we have is not, uh, it's not uh, motivated by humanism, it is motivated by the love of God. What is it that constrains us? It is the love of Christ that constrains us. What would provoke me uh, to say, you know what, if if somebody wrongs me, another believer, and say, you know what, I forgive you. Why can I forgive them? Because God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven me. That's why I can forgive, and that's why I ought to forgive somebody else. Why? Because of the example of the love of God. He goes on in chapter 3. Notice of 1 John. 1 John 3, notice verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth his bowels, his, his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, and in truth. The evidence of discipleship. Now we ought to stand for the word of God. We ought to be a soul winning church. We ought to be reaching people. Uh, we ought to share the gospel with as many people as we can. We ought to do all those things. But may I say what, is, what must be present in all of these things is love. Love. You know we're all different. We all have different personalities. People have things they like and things they don't like. Uh, People think that, you know, I I like to hunt. Some people think that I'm a bad person because I hunt, you know, for food. Some people are just against that. There's different things that we're interested in. May I say that we all have differences. We're all different. We're all made different. But that should not keep us from loving one another. It shouldn't. You know, a church is really a family. And with a family, you work things out together, right? You don't go around, Chris. I mean, uh, when we growing up, my dad just nipped it in the bud. And sometimes it got to the place where if we didn't act right towards another, he would make, I remember the worst thing he could possibly do. When When there was conflict, he says, tell your brother, you're sorry. So, but he started. No, tell your brother you're sorry. And if you don't tell him, tell him you're sorry, you're going to kiss him on the cheek. I said, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll settle that right quick. But you work it out. There ought to be no place for conflict, hatred among the people of God and the church of God. Because then the world looks at it and says, Is that what uh, the church looks like? Then uh, I don't want any part in it. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. And may I say, I believe this with all my heart, that when we have that love uh, for God and the love for one another, uh, many things in our lives will be settled. 
You see, if we love God like we ought, we're going to take Him in His Word and say, you know, God, it's not, it's not what, what I want, it's what you want. So therefore, I'm going to obey your Word. Because I love you, Lord. You see, that, that'll, that'll settle some things. Uh, you know, uh, there was a transition in my life when I, I remember... There was a time in my life when I obeyed my father because I had to. There were consequences for disobedience. But I remember in my life when there was a transition to where I wanted to. There's a difference there. And you know what I want for my children? I don't want them to obey me because they have to. I hope they get to the place when they obey me because they want to. That's, that, that just changes everything, doesn't it? Right. When you obey, when you do the right thing because you want to, because of the love that's there. Right. You know, I, I, I didn't want to disappoint my dad because I loved him. That's where I got to that place. I, I, I don't want to be a reproach to my, to my dad. I don't, I, I don't want people to say things because I love my dad. The motivation was love. And the motivation among us to love ought to be because of God's love. And so again, this is the evidence of discipleship. So we have noticed the commandment from Jesus, the exaltation of his deity, the explanation of departure, and the evidence of discipleship. But number three, we have the commitment from Peter. Now notice what Peter says. If you go back to John chapter 13. The Bible says, Verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest? Now, he kind of <laughs> skipped what Jesus just talked about. <laughs> Forget about the new commandment. Where are you going? That's what he said. Uh, he was just been, I think it's been kind of running in his mind all the while here while Jesus Christ has been talking. He's been saying, well, where is he going? I don't want him to leave. So notice that Simon Peter said to him, Lord, whither, thou go, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. We see, first of all, the inquiry from Peter. Peter asked the question, and think about it, he is kind of discounting what Jesus Christ had just been saying. Uh, the important thing that Jesus wants them to get is not the fact that uh, he is going to leave right now. He says, look, I'm giving you a new commandment. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to live by. This command I want you to live by. Uh, this is something new that I'm telling you. I've been preparing you all this time. I'm telling you, I'm about to be taken in the hands of sinners. I'm about to be crucified. I've been talking to that for many years now. But this is what I want you to know now. Before I leave, this is now the time when God is to be glorified and I'm going to go away, but this is what I want you to know. I want you to know this new commandment. You need to have a loved one for another. Why? Because apparently there probably was conflict there. Most of these guys, probably except Judas, most of these men were hardworking men. We would call them, you know, blue-collar workers. Fishermen. Judas was probably the only one out of all the disciples that I can think of right now that wasn't that way. I mean, they were hard men, and Peter was a kind of guy that liked to speak up. Uh, J uh, John was probably the youngest of them all. And so he probably kind of, you know, followed along, was the dearest to the Lord, the youngest. But Peter was kind of a man that kind of liked to throw his weight around, if you would. Let everybody knows, know what he, th what he thought. And some people are like that today. Whatever they think, it just comes out of the mouth. That's how Peter was. And here he, the inquiry is, not on the same page where Jesus was. He says, whither goest thou? He just told them where he was going, that he, they could not come. He says, you can't follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Now some people say in this passage, it means that Peter and he would die later, Peter crucified. And so some people say that Jesus was talking about the fact that uh, he would not go to the cross with him now, but he would afterwards. I don't think that's just what he's talking about. He's talking about heaven. You can't come with me to heaven now, but you will afterwards. You will then. 
So we see next his intention. He says, verse 37, Peter saith unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Now I believe here Peter was honest. He was honest. Uh, Peter, I believe because, look, he's following the Lord. And yes, he voices his opinion, but he's forsaken all his business to follow the Lord. And here he says, look, I'll lay down my life for you. I believe he was sincere. We know his sincerity because remember when the soldiers came to Jesus Christ, he pulled out a sword and started you know, trying to chop people's heads off. He was sincere when he said what he said. But the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, Peter was wanted to the Lord to be impressed with him on the outside. He was willing to die. But what did Jesus just ask him? Jesus did not, he said, I don't want you to die, Peter. I want you to love. I want you to love your brothers that are in this room. Peter, I don't want you to sacrifice your life for me. Isn't that what 1 Corinthians 13 says? Though some die because of persecution and have not charity, they're nothing. They're, the death, the martyr's death that Peter was claiming to have would be, no, that's not what Jesus wanted. He didn't want Peter to face a martyr's death. He wanted Peter to learn to love his brethren, to love his church that Jesus Christ had started with him and his disciples. So we see the inquiry, the intention, but we see his imperfection. And Jesus replies, verse 38, Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down thy, thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto, unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, I count of the chapter ends on a sore note. Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail. He knew that. He still loved him. So I like to read verse 38 in the context. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to my, unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. So Jesus, you see here, he says, you're going to fail, Peter. You're going to deny me, as a matter of fact, three times. But he was not where Judas was. That abode in darkness. Remember what Judas did when he realized what he'd done? He went out and hanged himself. What did Peter do? He went out and he cried bitterly. Why? Because Jesus said, you're going to deny me thrice. But let not your heart be troubled. It's okay, Peter. You're going to fail. But I am still preparing a place for you. Amen. You're still going to have a home with me. You can't be with me now. But you're going to be with me afterwards. So here the message for Peter is, Peter... I don't need you to die for me. I just want you to love the brethren. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. And although you're going to fail, Peter, I want you to know that I am still preparing a place for you. That's a comfort for us. And you know, pretty much, I think everybody in this room would all agree, we're probably going to fail the Lord. But let not our heart be troubled. Because God is still preparing a place for us. But the commandment we have for us now, think about it. Jesus does not want us to die as martyrs today. Although we ought to be willing. He wants us to evidence to a world that's in darkness. That we are his disciples by our love for one another. 
Let's examine our lives and our hearts in light of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and see what truly is important in our lives to love one another. Let's pray.